everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to the uh, first of this semester's uh, speaker in the Kappa Center's Interdisciplinary Colloquium series. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Davis uh, today um, to, to give us our talk. The talk will be, um, you, so you wish to talk and then take questions, is that the, the aim? Yeah, about an hour. So keep your questions, take note of the slide number. Um, and for those people who are tuning in online, welcome. And there is also a, um, a way for you to text. If you follow the link on the page, you can text. Um, and someone here will be checking on that and can ask Sarah the question when it comes to that point. To give you some background, Sarah is an assistant professor in the Department of Teacher Education focusing on mathematics education. She's recently returned from six years in Singapore where she was a research scientist at the Singapore Learning Sciences Lab. Dr. Davis received her undergraduate degree in communications from Concordia University and her master's and doctorate in mathematics education from the University of Texas at Austin. The goal of her work is the creation of mathematical learning environments that support deep understanding, drawing upon student-generated knowledge. Her research uses wireless networked classroom technologies aimed at transforming the classroom into a dynamic environment, supporting discussion of deep disciplinary ideas through investigating student-created artifacts. In the past two years, the focus of her investigations has been on ways to make the student work captured by these systems both meaningful and useful to teachers. This work is critically important on classrooms uh, more and uh, more and more <laughs> to digital environments. The amount of information available is overwhelming, absent thoughtful and flexible ways to organize and analyze what the students have done. Um, I've known Sarah probably 10 years from her time uh, when she was working at Texas Instruments, and Sarah and others there have been a very influential in some of the development that we have done here at UMass Dartmouth um, in terms of classroom technology as well. So very excited to see uh, Sarah um, and what she's done. I'm keen to hear what she's been up to in Singapore for six years. Uh, so welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Hi. Um, so the focus of this will be um, on design of some of the new interfaces, but I wanted to spend a little time um, kind of talking about the work that we've done in Singapore. Also, we're using a data set that's unique, um, and so I want to give you guys some insight into where this data is coming from. Um, and then, depending on how fast or slow I talk, we will have more or less time for questions. Um, but I usually talk a little fast, so I think we should be good. Um, my work grows out of uh, Dr. Stroop's work focusing on generative activities. And generative refers to orchestrating classroom activity in ways that have the students generate all of the different artifacts and materials that you then base the mathematics lesson around. Another core part of um, the underlying philosophy of um, my mathematics approaches is in function-based algebra. Um, and here at the Capit Center, I know that you guys are very familiar with function-based algebra, but again, it's, it's an approach to teaching that really focuses on the multiple representations um, at all times, starting with um, the early introduction. So the six-year project in Singapore, um, the implementation, the research site, uh, it was a four-year design study. Uh, the treatment data for the study was collected at an upper-performing secondary school. Secondary would be somewhat compatible to our middle schools. Um, in Singapore, primary is uh, K through six, and then secondary is uh, seven, eight, nine, and then it gets a little different because um, they then do technical track and junior college track, um, and so it would be different from the US where it's straight junior high and then high school. So this is an upper performing secondary school. The control data was at a highly statistically similar secondary school that the Ministry of Education actually helped us identify. Um, in partnership with the head of maths at the treatment school, 
he did not want any of the classes not participating. He was very excited about the project. He was really interested in the technology. Um, he taught the SEC 4 students, and he was really talking about that they would get to him, and if you gave them an equation, they could meticulously plot the points and then draw the graph, but they had no intuitive sense of what graphs should look like, what the tables of values would be, and so he was very interested in introducing a function-based approach at the SEC 1, SEC 2 level, so that by the time they got to SEC 4, they would have a more robust understanding. So for this reason, we had to find a control site that was a separate campus. Um, and you can imagine how excited schools were to just be the location that we came and gave pretests and post-tests. Um, so the Ministry of Education was really quite lovely, helped us identify a school that was um, demographically similar, financially similar, test score similar. Um, in, in Singapore, there's enough data because it's a closed system, it's an island, that when they say two, two schools are just statistically similar, they're really close. Um, and then they helped convince the school that, um, that they wanted us to come in and do pre-tests and post-tests with all of their students. Uh, so it was secondary one, which is about 12 or 13 years old. It was all sections of the express track classes. Uh, Singapore still does banding, um, which is not as familiar in the US anymore, or not explicitly familiar, but still quite prevalent. Um, class sizes actually ranged from 38 to 42 students. 40 was the typical class size. Um, and we did a 12-week curricular unit that I'll talk more about in just a second. Um, our control group, we had 194 students and the treatment had 210. The technology that we're, we were using in this was the original TI Navigator, the 3.0 system that worked with the 83 plus. Um, each of the students had their own graph and calculator get connected to the hubs, so four students per hub, and then the hub communicated with the teacher's upfront computer. The teacher's computer was the group display space, and the student's computer was their private space and their workspace. This wasn't just the technology innovation. I actually start from an idea of the curriculum that I want to implement and the type of classroom practices I want to facilitate. So this implementation actually started with the curriculum and the technology supported that curriculum. Our curriculum design started with an idea that there are concepts and skills in mathematics, that there are huge overarching concepts um, that are found, and a, a big understanding of these concepts is very important, but that there are also direct skills that support that. Um, and so let me talk about the two on, on the two pages and then tell, speak more about how I, how I kind of envisioned them with the project. So the three big concepts um, that we broke the curriculum into, um, and this also grows out of work that uh, Dr. Lupita Carmona and Dr. Walter Stroop and I did um, at the University of Texas, um, was really looking at are there big conceptual chunks to break the algebra curriculum into. And we, the three large chunks that we identified were concepts of equivalence, concepts of equals, and then manipulations of linear functions. And so these are the big concepts. These are the, the things that we did very big generative conceptual activities. But each of these is also made up of skills. And so in equivalence, you have things like simplifying, combining like terms, factoring, um, expanding, and equals, you're solving. Uh, you're doing the same thing to both sides. Uh, there are rules with equalities. You know, you flip the positive and negative sign. And then with linear function, it's all your ideas of slope and gradient and intercept. When we were working with the curriculum specialists to develop the activities, we focused on having one or two generative activities to focus on the big concepts, but we also left traditional instruction um, for the skill ideas. So even though the idea of equivalence, and I'll talk you through an activity that, that goes over equivalence, we wanted them to have a big conceptual idea of equivalence, but when it comes to things like combining like terms or factoring or canceling, I really felt as part of this project, it was okay that some of the things were made direct instruction. Because if that direct instruction was then anchored to a conceptual activity that helped give the students a big idea of what the individual components of what they were doing fit in the big picture. So as an exemplar activity, um, it's kind of most common generative activity that's talked about. Uh, function activity, students start out on their calculators, they see one point, and on um, the upfront screen, they see the group of points like you see. 
They're given a series of rules to get to learn the space, but then they're given a very specific mathematical rule, and they're 